There we go. Welcome to the next episode. This is the Christmas Christmas special of the Cathode Raid podcast. Steve, my good friend, how you doing, man? Hey, Lewis. Happy holidays, friend. And how Happy is everybody on. out there at YouTube land? We're here to uh, brighten your December 25th with a we surprise are. episode. Are we doing this on this is on your channel? Yes, yes, is this yes, your channel absolutely. One? Yeah. Let's talk about that just for a quick second today. Today we're going to mm-hmm. be featuring our 6th episode of the Cathode Ray podcast which Lewis and I mean we've been kicking butt with this thing and uh <laughs> 6 episodes down we've already got number 7 ready that's why this one's special it's during the middle of the week mm-hmm. and then we're normally on Mondays over at Zez Retro so uh yeah 6 already man now we're just cranking them out what it's good, man. It's what you got to do. You just got to get in there and keep doing them, right? You think like, what the fuck <laughs> are we going to talk about every week for an hour, especially when you're limited to old televisions, but somehow we're going to do it. Uh, I appreciate all the comments, loads of people writing and, and saying they enjoy it. That's real, real nice of people. And yeah, this one's now on your channel. So they're on the, the big leagues for the Christmas special. So we thought we were thinking maybe we'll just uh, shoot the shit. You know, there's some CRT talk, but there's just Christmas talk fun. Let's have a bit of fun with this episode. Yeah, and kind of just the way we're throwing it on this channel is just to appeal maybe to uh, some new people that want to come over and check it out. Now, mm-hmm. I did make um, a playlist for our podcast over on my channel, too. So if you're on the oh, channel and you click on the playlist button, you'll see the Cathode Ray podcast, and it will have... Actually, our first podcast we even did together where it wasn't part of that. Um, That's number one. And then from there, it's in chronological order one up to now six. And then number seven will be out Monday on your channel where it normally will be. And then occasionally we'll come back and have specials on our channel here. But the main thing is most of these podcasts are going to be over there. And like I said, we've already got a good catalog building. And if you've missed anything, you can go check out the playlist and um, definitely go check out Lewis's channel. Uh, but again, we and we already had, since we were able to do this, we already had uh, the next one, number seven, ready to go. Mm. So, Lewis, um, why don't you tell us a little bit about what we got in number seven? So we were uh, the one that will be out next week on the Zez Retro channel. That is the very first podcast that Steve and I have done with somebody else. It's our first interview, our first steps into that territory. And it was with Thomas Dade, who you know from the open source CRT project, uh, you may have just seen the interview that Bob from Retro RGB put out in the last days. And uh, he's got this absolutely amazing project about resourcing. And, and basically, it seems like he's trying to replace everything but the tube in a CRT. And he was a lovely guy. Uh, I enjoyed the talk. I, I think he was great. I think, honestly, uh, Steve, we, uh, we, you and I, we're going to work a little bit on our interview technique. I think we learned something. And uh, poor old Thomas, he was sitting there, you, us two are yelling at each other, and there's Thomas going, what the fuck are these two idiots? What have I got myself I'm into? Sorry, <laughs> exactly. So, Thomas, we thank you right. for being on, and uh, we thank for everyone listening, and, and no, we're, we're working on it. So, it was fun, though. It was a lot of fun and very interesting project. What are some of your takeaways from that, that interview? Well, Steve? I definitely think we brought a kind of a different perspective than his original interview with Bob. Bob got into a lot of these technical mm-hmm. things that... Um, really we're even over our kind of or my uh understanding on Mm. certain aspects of crts not only that but uh you could tell just by talking to uh thomas that he had an incredible knowledge of just power circuitry and things like that on an expert level an engineering level so um you know my takeaways were that uh he's working hard on a great project it's still early on in this project and there's a lot of things that um need to be done to kind of help the project be more universal but it's going Mm. in that direction i also thought that uh you know thomas is obviously we were trying to dig in more and get into like what his passions were that made him interested in the project so i thought that was a cool aspect that people would probably expect us to kind of talk about so um other than that you know i will mention that thomas was kind enough to jump on with us and it was like uh, a situation where he was out of town so once it got towards the end of our interview, uh, there were some hiccups with some audio. I tried to go in and kind of abbreviate kind of knew what I knew that he was trying to say sometimes when I could tell. But uh, that's like you said, it's all growing pains. We're learning this stuff. Uh, it's definitely still going to be entertaining. And that's kind of like what uh, we're doing here is we're trying to take and talk about things that are current and also interesting to us 
in the technology world, pop culture, whatever's going on really within our little framework mm. of the internet. And uh, so that's, yeah, that's our appeal to you today is just to like check out uh, don't forget to check check out this interview with Thomas. We definitely appreciate any feedback you guys have for it, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah. So who who would you like us to talk to? And, and sort of, yeah, in that idea that, like, by now you get an idea of what Lewis and Steve do. You know, like, if you like our thing and you want us to interview them in that way, uh, there's there's room for improvement. And also, Steve, I think it's it's good to to mention that, like, it, it's also more difficult because it's online. I know that when you're in a room with someone, you're in a studio, there's a bit of a couch, there's like a million extra little subtle visual cues and non, uh, non-verbal cues that you get that help things flow and when you've got like this laggy internet and you know and again kudos to, to thomas he was on holiday the poor guy he's <laughs> he's not even at his home he was on holiday i was like come on let's do the interview and he's like okay <laughs> yes yes whatever you need lewis he's very nice very polite gentleman uh very nice guy so we're ki- kind of learning and one day we will get the 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 in person one day i will come to you steve and, something will, will come to us we'll and see we get, yeah something will happen we'll we work definitely on that will. Oh, but yeah, that interview was a lot of fun. I mean, it was always good to get some experience. Um, I don't really feel, uh, yeah, I feel like if, like you said, if people know what they are they're getting into with us and what what the, we're kind of building <laughs> here, then that's great. So, uh, but other than that, uh, let's see what else has been going on with you. Anything uh, anything new or? interesting not a lot not a lot this week i'm still taking it easy i was uh talking in the last podcast about the the accident that happened and uh you know like for me i'm still like physically fine i went to the doctor and the doctor does this all this shit and th- like pokes you and says how does it feel and can you see all the the fucking fingers and you're like yeah okay doctor i could see you so i had the the, the neurological check from the doctor and she thinks it's fine uh i'm still like a little bit like Sometimes I can be very absent-minded. And I think also that's what comes over in the, the interview we did with Thomas. I'm still a bit off with the, the pixies at times. so um, Well, that's completely I'm understandable. Sort of taking it easy. You know, it's not. Yeah, I'm just taking it easy. So it's been a pretty easy week. Uh, not, not too much going on, just getting ready for Christmas. Yeah. Uh, Christmas here in Estonia, and I guess that's going to be our topic. So, uh, of what we're doing for Christmas, yeah, it's uh, it's minus eight outside today. We've got a fresh few inches of powder outside. It's it's cold as fuck. It's beautiful. It's I bet it's, it's amazingly beautiful. Yeah. beautiful. It's if un uh, undescribably beautiful, but so fucking cold and depressing. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. Thankfully, uh, this week it was crazy. I had some. Uh, family come in town earlier for Christmas and they came and stayed and we did some things and uh, and celebrated at the same time they came from miles away. My daughter had a Nutcracker performance that she had to do. And so that was fun. Oh, she was, she's six years old. So she had roles like uh, a mouse and then a lady mouse. It was pretty funny. She was really into it. (laughs) So she was that. And then, sugar from sugar and spice at like a sugar bo- box that came out and danced it was really fun and cute so family came out for that uh but the weather was in- insanely warm for us i'm in virginia mm. and that's right on the coast of the eastern united states i'm about two to three hours inland and uh it's it was 60 plus degrees the weekend which is fahrenheit so that's that's pretty mild weather normally it should be half that 30s and and, and cold here and definitely no signs of snow yet but um hopeful that something will come i'm sure this year cuz i wanted to actually get into there's a snow ski lodge that i used to work at as a teenager and Ooh. it's about 15 miles from my house now and i wanted to go back this year and try that out uh at, so are there some are you living near some yeah no i live in the, the mount, a mountainous there. area okay, yeah. and the there's a peak of a mountain again right down 15 miles from here and there's a big resort mm. that's been there for a long time and you have stories about even when i was a teenager and worked there that was pretty wild my dad was actually the lift manager and i was <laughs> 
I think I was like 17, and so that was that was a trip because you know, it's just. I was going to say, at 17, at you're 17, like, you're like whoa, this is awesome yeah. because I'm at the ski park, right? That seems cool. And it, the oh. part that, uh, and then my dad was like everybody's shift boss, and so it was all a bunch of college kids also. There's about a half a dozen campuses within 30 miles of where I live. Just There's a real big college, and then there's five other smaller universities that are private but they also a lot of those kids stay in town and go work for a season in the holidays up there at uh, the mountain so yeah that'll be interesting to go back and hang out at this year yeah. um what was your what was your job oh when you gosh. were 17 and working there what was <laughs> it, it wasn't even i'm gonna push it, it. wasn't Here even go, it didn't have anything <laughs> to do with skiing so i got on and they were like we're gonna put you at the tubing park so do you know oh. what tubing is like so you get all oh, that where you got the inflatable yes, so inflatable donut it was an inflatable donut tube and it, they made these special slopes on the mountain that you could ride and get on these tubes and and ride down them and people loved it because again mm -hmm. anybody can tube it takes some skill to stand mm. there in those uncomfortable skis but anybody can go put on snow gear and go out and tube and have a great time it had these special lifts that you would sit on the tube and then you just throw out your hook from your thing like a lasso you give it to me i was one of the guys that was mm. one of the jobs it was like you'd have somebody hand you their tube and you'd hook it on this thing and this lift would pull them up to the top of the <laughs> slope oh you're at the bottom and yeah so well they, that was one of the jobs so you'd switch around in the jobs so it's like i mean it's very you know entry level task stuff and i uh i almost got a concussion one day <laughs> Uh, so there's a couple of jobs out there. You one person would be a couple of people would be working at the bottom of the lift, uh, like I said, doing helping people get on, and there'd be somebody at the top helping them get out, and then there'd be lines, and then they would have uh, basically tracks where they'd have six lanes that you go down uh, from the top, and then you get down to the bottom, and there'd have to be somebody at the bottom saying, "Hey, I'm glad you got out. you made it. Now can you get out of the way? Because more people are coming, yeah. and they're about to run you over." And usually, it wasn't a big deal. People would have plenty of time to get out of the way because it was sloped up in a way that it was supposed to slow them down. And then there was hay, and then at the back though were these huge nets with giant hay bales in yellow tarp like baggies zipped up big huge things and then behind that was a little wooden fence and off that was like a cliff ravine into a <laughs> creek and so it was like this is your safety right so the naturally mm. it's supposed to taper up a little bit so your tube comes down and starts slowing down as it goes up and then oh, yeah, and then yeah, you yeah. Can get out up here on top and if it keeps going like 20 feet past that's when you hit the net and the okay. the 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 uh, hay bale inside that was in the net, so it's like a pillow in a net, and then the fence, mm -hmm. and then the cliff. So one day we got out there, and it had just been ice cold, you know, down to zero, and everything was frozen over iced, and that was always the worst because if you got on a mm -hmm. tube, you got your momentum going. That was when you'd start hitting close to those safety bags because you go fast yeah well you would go fast right. there's just, no zoom. speed slow down nothing yeah. there's no way to slow it down you don't want to mm -hmm. fall off and what would happen is we got out there this one day and we'd always test run them because we'd get there we'd test mm -hmm. run every lane and make sure it wasn't running too fast but we knew we were screwed this day because we were test running these things <laughs> and we were just like naturally on our own by ourselves hitting the darn nets and and we were every time we'd go up and like we could we'd, we'd have to be like co concentrating not to hit the net and i was like this is gonna be hell and it was <laughs> it was like we got up there we're like all right first off nobody usually you could do groups two or three people together and that was a no-no because then everybody would hit it together and explode but when you're when you're like doing it and you don't realize you're not supposed to hit the, the net you like think you're hitting the net and they're like oh this is part of the experience so people would hit the net yeah. laugh their butts off and get up and like slowly get out of the way uh so my job that day unfortunately was to be the grunt at the bottom of the hill trying to help people get out of the way <laughs> and i was sitting there and i mean this huge this huge fat guy comes flying down the hill you know runs and hits that thing and he's just giggling <laughs> laughing and i'm like come on man i know it's fun you gotta get out of the way and i'm like lifting him up you know and i've got my back turned and i'm like we're about to get killed 
And I get him up and I get him out of the way. And I'm like, whew. And the next thing I knew, I turned around, faced back yeah. towards the slopes. And I literally immediately got clipped at my shins, flipped over, and was out cold. Just, I was knocked Dang, out cold. Yep. And then I woke up in the little shack. And they were like, here, Steve, have some hot cocoa. Uh, you don't have to worry about working too hard the rest of the day. And I was like, where am I? What, what just happened? <laughs> what just happened? I've got shell shock. I don't know what happened. You were so, just, yeah. oh, you my were just out of it. Was, like that that yeah. was a nightmare. So you, what, you got clipped on the ankle. Yeah, I got and clipped on the shins. Like, I turned around at perfect yeah. timing, got clipped in the shins, and it literally made me go head over heels. Like, I was so quick. Dang. And then uh because you're on the ice oh yeah it was all ice so that was that was uh that was like my most memorable experience i think i only worked that job again for one one like month or something while i was in town was that like the good old days though where you're like oh you slipped and you got a concussion yeah you have a cocoa and get the fuck oh back out oh there. yeah no fine. no no like, like i said yeah like, like have a cocoa just uh <laughs> don't 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 pretend like you'd hurt you though come on you're tough you know, so yeah, it's... yeah, exactly. Get out there. There's no idea of like concussion can come later. They didn't or, care. Or no, anything but that else. was no, 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 thankfully right. nothing serious had happened. I don't think, but I never got checked. Mm. Maybe that's what's wrong. So with that me. resort is still there. So is it still possible, like today? Oh, to tubing, go yeah, tubing? yeah, the tubing. I've already looked it up. Ah. You can still go tubing in the tubing park. So <laughs> if uh, when I go, yeah, I'll definitely look it back at it and see if it's if they've changed it any. I bet that I bet they. Oh, you got to take some. I photos bet they've for changed. Surely they've changed that decision. Somebody had to go flying yeah. off that ravine one time. I'm telling you, man, it was just like, it was too perfect. Because you go, and you'd be like, oh my gosh. But we knew it was a, that day. I could just, it was, it it must have been like, I, I don't know. It's it's like when you're a a, a retail worker and you know that Black Friday is coming mm. up after Thanksgiving and you're just dreading it. You know it's going to be terrible. So that's mm. that's kind of like the feeling we had that day. It was a busy day and it was icy and it was going to be ru ruthless. Right. So It would be good to know like what's changed in whatever the 20 plus years yeah, or something. Yeah, it's been 20 years. Like cuz there's 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 uh, laws about this <laughs> shit now about how you got just like let people knock over and knock their heads and there's procedures if someone gets knocked out and you can't just fling someone down. Look, maybe in the United Free States of America you're still allowed to fling someone down a mountain and <laughs> Fuck, it doesn't matter. Look, but it's free, but I'm knocked Ooh. out, but it doesn't matter. You're in America and free. It's okay. Yeah, you gotta get <laughs> free. Free, to be free, out. To, free to do your own stupid stuff. That's what it is. Free yeah, to free yeah, to, your, that's free to do your own thing. That is a nice thing about America. For all its good oh, and yeah. its bads. So like I like that. That bit is, is nice. So yeah, that's that's something I'm looking forward to this uh, winter. Um I've got yeah. A lot of things. I, the, the, that's the cool thing about where I live now is there's a lot more outdoor stuff to kind of do. Uh, so I'm, I'll be excited, too, for spring and things like that, of course, once the cold, cold goes away. I'm thankful that it's not negative anything here. Oh, yeah. Like that's, that when sounds negative. awful. Now, like just, I just can't imagine the heating. How, how the heck do you – I mean, what tip, how, how warm could you even keep your place? They – I, okay, as a, an Australian person, I also had that question when I first arrived. What the, how the fuck, how, what, how, how does it, aren't we all just sitting there freezing the whole time? No, it turns out that these people have learned something <laughs> called insulation. Apparently it's a thing. Uh, we don't have it in Australia. If you grew up in Australia, you grew up in like double brick and that's it. Like there's nothing else in between. My mother is, I'm like, I'm coldest when I'm home in Australia in winter at my parents' place. And I'm like, mom, I'm fucking cold. She's like, nah, but the heater, it's going to cost too much and it costs too much. I'm like, insulate, have you heard about insulation, mom? It's maybe you put extra glass there and no, 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 we don't do that shit in Australia. So it's all, if you're surrounded by just this freezing cold, you learn. We have such technologies. Also, sauna is very big here. So it's a huge part of the culture to... Uh, I lived in a place for about a year that had a sauna in the bathroom and uh, it was tremendous. Just every night was just sort of became part of the ritual to go in there and heat up. And then, and then you go out in the snow and you let the snow or you, you just be in the cold for a while and you got to be in the cold and then you go into the hut and then you got to be in the hut and then you go into the cold and, uh, it helps. I I always associated sauna as some weird thing at a few <laughs> gyms where there was like old fat guys sitting there in their like little fucking, the Schwitz, uh, the little Schwitz. yeah, their little swimmers, yeah. yeah. And uh, here it's like totally normal. Yeah. Everyone goes naked. Everyone My goes naked. My parents came to Estonia. 
Yeah, everyone awesome. goes naked. My parents came to Estonia. My mother wouldn't go in. <laughs> my father was like, okay, I'll go in, but only in my little swimmers, you know, little <laughs> swimming trunks they have when they're in the Olympics yeah, yeah. and shit. And we're all sitting there naked, like, this is what we do. And my dad's there and like... So it's totally Ooh. fine to go naked. Total. It's weird if you don't go yeah. naked. And yeah. the conversations you have, uh, even at my local gym, there's a local gym, and I go there, and there are a few guys, and we're just sitting around, dicks <laughs> out, chatting <laughs> with each other in the gym. It's normal. <laughs> Dare well, I? I would not offend that's, their beautiful that's culture. That's hilarious. Um, and and like you say, it is different depending on the culture. My wife, when. Mm. Uh, when we met, she was actually in her last year of teaching. So she went and did this, the abroad program where you can teach English in Japan. Mm. And she oh, no did shit. that That's for great. three years. And then I met her on a, when she came home for a wedding trip um, on her final year. And, but anyway, she, uh, she lived over in Japan again and in a very small community and they would go to hot springs, you know, outside. And she said, yeah, that was the culture for everybody to go, go naked. Right. And, and yeah. so this was, but Hey, like we're talking about 20, you know, something years ago, um, over oh. that long, probably now yeah, 20, 25 years ago. So she was saying that, <laughs> so in the culture that they were there, there with the, uh, the ladies, it, it all it meant. So if you had trimmed or like a shaved, uh, um, pubic yeah. area, that you that meant uh -huh. that you were in trouble or like being shamed or something. Like it was a shame thing oh. for like your family, like you did something wrong. <laughs> Oh, so that's and how so and you're like, free to the world there. Everyone can yeah, see. Yeah, and then like if you're not, then you'd have like she said, like everybody would just have huge bushes. Amazon, yeah, and unless you Amazon um, and so rainforests. Yeah, and then, and then she laughs because she talked to people in other areas, and they say, "Oh, that's not part of the you know, that's not part of this thing." So it, it might have just been in the small. I'm saying she was in like this small mountainous. Uh, community that they had uh, not very many people, like less than a thousand, and she would have to spend two days traveling just to get to the Tokyo airport or something, to, or you know, get back to the United States. So yeah, that's kind of interesting <sighs> thing about cultural bathhouses. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It's uh, and now now it seems fine. Now now it's okay because now after a while you're like. I think it's maybe for all our international friends, we're all sitting here thinking like, oh my God, you American Puritans, <laughs> we can't see each other. Look, I was no, the no, same. No. I, was I the always same. thought it was the fascinating. Lack. I remember growing up and there were always uh, rumors that you could see like naked people just on the news in other cultures. Like the nightly news would have certain <laughs> it, cultures would have like topless news or something. And uh, we just were baffled by the idea of that. And here, yeah, here the during the 80s and 90s, mm. it was like, advisory everything. No, you can't see anything. No. So now. During the 90s in Australia, uh, through the 80s and 90s, there was like a, a that was before the, before cable, before we even had cable, we just had the free to air, like the five, six channels right. of whatever local stuff. And there was one, and Australians will know what I'm talking about. It's called SBS. And it was meant to be uh, international material, more artistic, more creative stuff. But it was a whole channel. And they would have news from around the world. And you could watch some weird movie from Korea or something. We never knew it. And you kind of, as a kid, you knew. If you watched SBS after 11, if there was a movie on, there was probably boobs in it. <laughs> And uh, that was, we were just like, oh, that's what they do in other countries. They're really <laughs> fine with their boobs, I, I guess. That's so cool. odd. I think every 90s Australian yeah, kids remember that was staying it. up watching SBS to see some that boobs. Was, they, they, <laughs> and it's cultural. Yeah, they, yeah. Got, they got the ratings kick, you know. They were like, what's this ratings <laughs> kick coming for at 11 o'clock? It's every prepubescent <sighs> teenager wanting to see something on TV for free. Mm. Um, but we were, yeah. we were talking about... Uh, different areas now i have uh spent a few christmases in japan myself uh i've been four times i think something like this uh over the last whatever six years because we haven't been able to travel for a while and originally 
I, I started to go to Japan due to my job. So I'm an entertainer, I'm a stand-up, I'm a host. And you work a lot. Typically, we were, before pandemic, working a lot during November and December. There's parties, there's Christmas parties, there's company parties. Everybody needs a host, everybody needs a comedian, everybody needs some entertainment. So we're working, working, and it'll be a very intense period. Uh, sometimes multiple gigs a night. That's very fun. To uh, you're doing a stand up in some restaurant for one company, and then an hour later you're down the other restaurant doing it, and it's really exciting. And so then the Christmas would end, and especially then when I didn't have a girlfriend, or maybe sometimes when I did, I would just be like, ah, what do I do now? And so what I ended up doing was going sort of once my last gig was done, maybe around the 20th or 19th of December or something, I would fly to Japan. And not only was that great. For a million retro gaming regions, uh, if anyone knows hard off the stores, they're just unbelievable. It's an amazing place to learn and pick up old retro stuff. But um, Japan does not shut down for Western Christmas. They there is a thing, and they know it as Christmas, and it's a Christmas, and kind of like how you know. But they don't stop. Uh, I don't understand the culture, and maybe someone in the comments can help me out. I'm because I'm not very detailed with the culture, but they like Chris, like whatever our whatever Christmas Day is, they don't stop. They keep going. They may take half a day off on New Year's Day, but I found just again from my observations that was it. So. After working, after so keep in mind, I'm I'm performing. I'm a stand up. I've performed at about twenty fucking Christmas parties by this stage, <laughs> and I'm like, I'm done with Christmas. I want to go to the place where there's no Christmas, mm -hmm. and you would go to Japan, and everything's open, and it's normal, and there's no shutdown between Christmas and New Year, and not only uh, they they don't celebrate uh, Christmas in Japan the same way we do, but there's a, a really interesting cultural aspect that on christmas japanese people eat fried chicken <laughs> really that's, that's their awesome. thing honestly that's their thing and you can order fried chicken uh they have many 7-elevens and uh, lawson and like these sort of convenience stores you almost can't go two blocks anywhere in tokyo without coming across some sort of convenience <laughs> store now first of all each of them serves fried chicken 23 hours a day. There's about an hour from 4 to 5 a.m. where you can't, where they're cleaning the thing. They always have fried chicken. And if on Christmas you make your order to the 7 Eleven for whatever you want for Christmas Day, I need, I, I want this many pieces. And you then go to the corner and eat <laughs> your fried chicken. It's so weird. On Christmas. It's so weird. My, I, I, I asked my wife what they did during Christmas too, and mm, she said mm. the same thing. They would maybe acknowledge it. She never said anything about fried chicken. I'll ask her if they did anything like that in her area. Sure. She said that uh, they were more. They would celebrate more, like you say, at New Year's than christmas and christmas really wasn't a thing they would give more gifts at the new year's and they wouldn't give gifts okay. sorry wouldn't give gifts on christmas actually uh at all mm -hmm. really so and she had to go back to work too like you say and so it's not yeah right it's a regular it's an, work yeah, day, it's a normal so day gotta... and i often talk to all you right. about this stuff because as americans we have different holidays that aren't celebrated obviously in other areas for example mm -hmm. uh Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving we just went through and we go. uh, I used to also work in construction and uh, I used to talk to people about uh, these other holidays that were supposedly in existence and um, one of them I always thought was funny was Cinco de Mayo and I don't think that oh. is a real holiday <laughs> It's just a day for like beer to be drank. I'm not positive on that. But like Americans in yeah, your yeah. culture, it's just like it all of a sudden it's yeah. been put together as a drinking beer day. But <laughs> I don't know if anybody can enlighten us in the comments on that. I just seem to remember that one is coming up a lot as being like, no, nah, that's not really anything we celebrate. Um, but there's also a um, a reason why. So the question then becomes, why do Japanese people love fried chicken? That's the American on thing, Christmas. Right? It's maybe right. Why is, is it, that? It's an ode to America or something. Fried chicken and in marketed a way, in a that. way. So, 
So the story, the story goes, and again, I'll, I'm far reaching on cultural things. If anyone knows more, please write in the comments. But the, I, the, the, the legend goes that there was the back in the day, and I want to say 70s, 80s, this sort of thing. There was the guy who was trying to bring KFC chicken to Japan. He's an entrepreneur. He's trying to do that, trying to bring, you know, he's like, well, Americans love it. We, we might be able to get it going. They open up the, the KFC store and no one's buying this stuff, right? Japanese people, they don't understand it. They don't know what this is. It's maybe they've heard something American about it, but they don't really know. And this Japanese bloke, the manager of KFC, the OG manager of KFC in Japan, he's scratching his head and he, he starts to think, well, turkey, chicken, he starts to kind of build this connection. And so their whole marketing campaign was Americans eat fried chicken at Christmas. <laughs> Turkey fried chicken, right? They yeah. he took it uh, Thanksgiving. Yes. It's not even Christmas. Doesn't matter. He sort of blended it all in. Like you've heard, these crazy American people eat turkey. Well, that means they eat oh. chicken at Christmas. Mm. Ah, and it sounds okay. nuts, okay. but it was since we eat turkey it, it at was chicken. The way that, Thanksgiving. that fried chicken got established through through that 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 bounds. It was his sort of hail mary marketing campaign yes american people this is what american people eat fried chicken at christmas so you should too and now it's a thing <laughs> now and i'm sure there's much more to it someone else could that's fill awesome. me in, but i i'm happy i ate my fried chicken at christmas i'll do the cultural thing uh, yeah i bet it was really really good too if they were just trying to sell it on that day especially i bet it was really good oh yeah and there's always fried chicken available i mean you can go to the kfc but ev it's everywhere yeah. it's it's not just a kfc thing anymore and it's i love I, I guess I love that story because it's it's something that we know turkey, chicken, roast at Christmas. And then the way that another culture, and not only just another culture took it, but there was some marketing guy there going, oh, I'm going to turn this around. And I'm, and through the, uh, through marketing, you know, he was just trying to sell fucking fried chicken. That's all this dude was of trying course. to do. He wasn't necessarily trying to change the country, but he inadvertently did yeah. that. In his quest to sell fried chicken, I love those yeah. little kind of weird stories. That's, that's of, really of interesting. I had I had uh, heard that there's a similar kind of story for the potato in like France, Ooh. where the original potato uh, was was viewed as like poisonous and trash food originally, and somebody was trying to get people to eat the potato, and he was running into the same problem. Nobody would want the potato, no matter how he cooked it. No matter how he proved that it was it was safe to eat and plentiful, um, the only way he eventually got people interested in the potato is he would grow fields of the potatoes, and then he mm. he he stopped selling the potatoes, and he put guards around the potato farm, and he <laughs> hired the guards and he said, "Look, I want people to steal these potatoes. So if you see them see them stealing the potatoes." Don't do anything to them. Just you just guard the potatoes like there's something valuable, and that's eventually right. how he got the potato to be interested by the French public as a food source, as opposed to just it being trash. Is literally by putting guards around it, and that small town eventually uh, came around to the potato. So that's and that's another little myth. There's a lot more to that story because, uh, like you said, it was mm. all psychological and like a marketing idea really for him to try to sell potatoes in the end but yeah that's cool i have a question for you as an american yeah. then okay while we're on this food topic and where foods come from and so forth <laughs> oh, i watched this i watched this documentary the other day what do i know on the history channel right here i am on the edge of europe watching american history and the history channel and they said that the hot dog was basically invented and uh popularized by a bloke called nathan down at coney island in new york have you heard of this story what do you think about i don't know it? that's probably it's either one of those legends to try to sell nathan's famous hot dogs and maybe that's why they're called nathan's famous i've never really heard this story because i know they address that in the documentary that he just said famous yeah. in a very american the most american move ever which is i've created something new i'll say i'll just write famous on it and then it you know, famous. a lot of these things, too, if we went back and looked, it could be that it's that or it could be that, you know, he saw somebody else's idea and just marketed it to the next level. Like the <laughs> like the Zuckerberg, the Zuckerberg Facebook thing where he took it from those twins in uh, in college. So, 
you know, it could be either one of those. Honestly, I've never heard that, but that's uh, that sounds that sounds like it would be, yeah, a History Channel thing. Sure. And I love this that that's also like as from the outside, like that's the American way. Like it's like oh, some some guy saw something and then he took it and marketed it better. Yeah. It's not viewed as I under, again I'm reaching out here in American culture as a bad thing. Like no, he was just smarter. Oh no 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 uh, like. Again, yeah, he was just better at it. He was just he's the one who Generally the idea not not uh, the idea that you can market something, it depends how you market it, right? If you're uh, if you're trying to scare people into stuff and things like that, that's viewed differently than it's trying to say, "Ah, you know, I brought this hot dog." But there are things and there are tales of food that are true. So for instance, the lobster, the lobster in Maine mm. lobster is famous now like probably worldwide Maine lobster northeast. Mm. But that, I've heard of that show. That but so sense. originally, Maine lobster and lobster in general was considered garbage food, and it was what it was done mm -hmm. is it was collected because they were there was so much of it they would collect it and feed it to prisoners, and uh, the the thing was is they would cook it and then just let it sit, you know, and then serve it, and it wasn't until. They started the train. There was a train line that went up and down through the Northeast that and in, into Maine to like New York and Philadelphia that had uh, used that train started picking up fresh live lobsters and they started cooking them live from live right then fresh and serving them on the train. And then that's what turned that in from literally something that nobody wanted to eat at one point and was considered like trash for prisoners to a decadent luxurious food and it was all because they figured out not to cook it and let it just sit out like you know mm. like some other meat and then it was just the fact they could cook it fresh and they turned it into a whole delicacy and now it's an entire industry around it dang that's a good one i haven't had a lobster for years i grew up in uh, a small coastal village of Australia, it's called Nelson Bay. It's about an hour north of Newcastle. If anyone, I mean, if anyone's watching, if you ever watched that Australian TV show Home and Away, it's just like that without the bad actors. It's just <laughs> this idyllic blue, golden sands and blue sky. And uh, yeah, we we could go down to the local uh, fish co-op or whatever where they fish market, and they, the fish would come in, and then you would go down in the afternoon and get the latest stuff. And I don't think I absolutely that's one of the things I didn't understand as a kid. Like, I just grew up where there's amazing seafood and some forest I can go through, and I'm gonna climb this mountain, and then I'm gonna literally go spear fishing. And I had no concept that that wasn't a childhood for almost anyone else in the world. Uh, and and that it's almost reason, well, why does Lewis live on the cold edge of Europe here in Estonia? Because I decided that the dolphins and the golden sand wasn't good enough for me. <laughs> I had to go traveling the world, and it turns out nowhere is quite like that. Yeah. But here I am, nevertheless. Well, that's cool. <laughs> yeah, that's what... Uh, um, even... yeah. There's, I think people underestimate a lot of the things you can still do in some areas. A lot of people mm -hmm. forget. Um, so if you're more into nature and things, that's kind of one of the reasons I came back here too, is to try to get back into some things that I had not done in a long time. I, there's a lake like where I lived, but I didn't, it wasn't really, um, I never really went on it to do anything like fishing. However, here I like to go on the river and do fishing like, you know, I know on a smaller boat and just drift and things did you take that boat oh you yeah were yeah about? i've got actually i got a new boat too my dad went out and got somebody you know it's winter so then he's like oh it's winter we're gonna find the best deal on a canoe so now i've got two of these things in the backyard <laughs> so that one's gigantic but at least it won't sink because it's plastic so next time i okay. hit is it big enough to put a outboard motor yes on, or yes so a little it? motor on it and um that'll be that'll be helpful because yeah last time we went way too far too long it turned dark and almost sank it was a nightmare at the end <laughs> I, don't, I think i broke a bone or two in my foot too it was i was in pain yeah. for like six to or eight weeks afterwards just in my foot it was funny that it. <laughs> Dang, did, did you have Brutus in no the canoe way. or the boat? I don't know. Well? I, I mean, see, I always have this feeling of disaster when I do these things with my dad. And uh, and so I, I was like, I'm putting my cell phone, I'm leaving it in the car because I know I'm like, <laughs> I, I'm like, we're going to get soaked. This boat's going to sink. And unfortunately, yeah, most of that kind of happened. And we got back after dark. And yeah, I was like, well, at least I didn't bring my phone. So I didn't have to worry about losing it or getting it wet. But. It was, uh, 
Did you catch oh, yeah. any? Oh, yeah. Caught tons of fish. That was the good thing is we caught so many fish wow. that at least it wasn't um, you go out there and nothing happens. We caught tons of fish. Mm. What is it like a uh, fish that you would uh, cook or smoke? You or could, but you I just release them. They're, they're mostly right, small fish nice. and, you know, like the big ones would be a uh, foot, foot and a half. Oh, okay. so, not, so not not i mean you could eat some of them because they're like trout and things like that but most of them you just throw back uh and and just keep going it's really cool though because you can see um you catch them there mostly well here's what i did I, I was trying to fish with this lure and i wasn't catching anything for like the first hour and i we stopped over on the rocks i think to take a leak or something and i looked down and there's a huge crawfish which you know looks like a little lobster mm -hmm. And they're all over in the river. So I just was like, screw this. I grabbed the clover crawfish and I put him on the hook. And then I was like, I'm just fishing with this. And I threw it out. And then like three minutes later, I caught my first fish with that. So I was like, awesome. And then I switched back over to the lure and, and started going and caught a ton of fish. And the cool, really interesting thing is it's so clear, the water in the river, that you can see even the deep parts. You can see all the way down to, say, 12 feet or something so you can watch the fish move and you can cast towards them and you can see when they see your bait and they're chasing it and then you watch them go up and hit it and it's that's really that's a lot of fun to sit there and watch them you know like you see sometimes you can see them so you aim over there and then watch them chase it uh the jig and it's uh it's a lot of fun uh doing it that way to get to, that's great to get on your jig do you need to pull it so you that can it yeah that like, tension, well, can they, can they, just... it's it's like a little flashy thing it looks literally like a christmas ornament funny enough and it just spins and they run up and just swallow it and uh then they'll start to move and then yeah you can just reel you're reeling slowly to keep the the lure moving and spinning and, and being flashy because if you stop the lure will stop and then the fish will just stop and turn around and go away mm, but if you keep it moving exciting. it doesn't look like right so lure, it doesn't yeah. look like enticing to them if it just stops so it's only if it's uh -huh. keeping moving so you got to get them sometimes you'll move too fast and, and run out of line you know so it's but it's a it's a lot of fun fishing like that and then yeah it's just more for the f aspect of doing it uh than to keep it and eat them you could but but yeah. um it's a it's sure, a funny thing and the great. river path is something that was traveled like for hundreds of years through north america for trade mm -hmm. you know before there were cars this was the path people took they right. would the river goes one direction so they would walk with uh i think what they would do is they would get all their goods together and they would build a wooden raft and they'd literally go down this low-lying raft either kind of riding it or if they had to get in lower waters pushing it and walking next to it and they would do this all the way up to a trade point they'd get to the trade point and since the river is only one way you're not going to go so mm, that's when yeah. you, they would literally get out after a couple of months and uh take the raft apart sell all that wood and everything they brought with them and then walk back along the riverbed <sighs> back to you know two or three states away by foot and that was a trade route and that, so you could wow. still go down there because it's not owned by anyone. So you can still get in these entry points and actually go down this, this waterway. And, um, mm. there's a few of them that are like that still around here. So that's really fun and cool to think about historically that. Yeah, that's great. That's, that's, that's years, what people, people used to do. That. Like, cause I, exactly my question was going to be Steve, the river goes one way. What the fuck did the people do? after that but it was just we, we walk, walk home. home that's it that's it's like yeah, now that's no. you think the part about like i bet that was always like the thing about if you were a new guy you know it's like ah oh, finally i'm gonna be out on my own i've left home i'm leaving the farm and i'm going on this trip to the big city to do this trade run as a grunt and they're all like you're like complaining about how hard it is and they're like ha you think this is hard wait till we walk home in the winter you know it's like man it's hard when you're not trying to burn your jacket to keep warm one night or something it's like tch. so yeah right. interesting stuff there a little bit of interesting it is. Uh, as, as a kid i used to um because i grew up sort of where i grew up uh there's on one side there's surf beaches and it faces the um, i want to say atlantic ocean i think it is or is that the pacific it's the pacific it faces the pacific ocean so great surf beaches but there was also a big uh, harbor essentially 
and inside then you could do some fishing and right near the headland right near where the harbor would exit into the ocean um i would go down there and catch squid or calamari uh as people might know it and it sort of looks like an octopus it's a little bit different to an octopus more or less the same thing and something people might know about squid is well squid's ink that's the um, the thing that the squid is known for, that it, it, it has a, a sort of an inky substance in it. And when it is threatened, it will spray that, <laughs> that ink out to try to disorient the enemy or whatever that is. So I would use these, these lures and they would look like a, a shrimp and they would be weighed. So they would look like a shrimp is a prawn, we say in Australia, going through the water. And then you pull one in. But the, the thing is that when you pull him in, um, because he's a squid with the ink, when you get him close, what you've got to do is then knock him against the rocks a few times. And then each one of those would he would... Like a teenager, a teenager on 4chan, just, <laughs> just get it out of his system. And then you could pull him in and then you've got cal- your squid, which you could make calamari from. Uh, yeah, geez, I'm just making calamari. <laughs> That's fresh. crazy. Yeah, I never thought about that, getting fresh calamari like that. That's awesome. Mm. Yeah, man, I, it's it's only frozen stuff up. Yeah, here, well, so that's I've had it in I restaurants. It. That I that's about it. I've never even seen it in really stores or anything here. Very much. Wow, because it comes. It's a tube. Yeah, right? yeah. That's it's mostly it's basically it's a tube chopped they, up and fried, uh, battered and fried. And then they make the ring. That's how they they do. And then that some there, of them will so. have the little tentacles on them still. You know. Yeah, sometimes you can uh, also cook the, t- the tentacles yeah, on the end. So. so I had no concept that that was an idyllic upbringing when yeah doing, right you just like huh? you just take it for granted caught right yeah squid. yeah caught a fucking squid now i want to leave this is boring <laughs> <laughs> yeah now now uh zuckerberg's gonna have everybody putting on oculus <laughs> and going oh well, i want to go squid fishing now oh, let's experience the experience <laughs> of experience it's like come on man all right uh, but yeah so let's uh let's jump over here i wanted to talk about some stuff here just real quickly mm-hmm. with you it being you know the end of the year now um pretty much and i have some interesting statistics i thought i'd go through Ooh. if that's all right with oh, you from, your from YouTube. youtube yeah produce production stuff okay. this isn't going to be like you know money made or anything like that that's not really uh <laughs> any but it's interesting any, though uh, we, we've all it, that's not really if any significance i would say if it was i would even add it in here but um yeah so if it's, it's, it's all right with you i could talk about some of the things yeah let's go through it so we're, we're giving a bit of a recap yeah, of your like channel, the some things of the that have happened What's been done? Mm, let's do it. Let's so, hear yeah, about it. People for example, it. we've gotten uh, 85 total, uh, and I actually produced another one, so it's probably 86 total videos uh, for the year 2021, which is mm-hmm. 86. I mean, that's about six, almost, it's almost right at my goal of six a month. And, um, I mean, it's about yeah. one and a half a week or so. And then, so, but uh, out of those, 14 of them were exclusively for Patreon. So that's not something anybody else, you know, if you're not on the Patreon, you wouldn't have seen those. Uh, but those were just behind the scenes, the exclusive shop tour that I've been doing for almost a year now. And then outside of that, so that leaves over 72 productions. And then of those, I only did four shorts, which I thought was interesting. YouTube's always trying to tell me to do more shorts. I do one every. <laughs> One one every weird, one every things. quarter, yeah. and I don't I don't know. I mean, to me, it's kind of like silly. I guess if I wanted to do that, I could go start a TikTok account. So that left uh, sixty. Oh yeah, I want to see Steve doing a little. Yes, yeah, yeah like right. This. That's uh, sure. Uh, people care about that. Sixty-eight <laughs> videos like that were production level. Uh, right. Nine total podcasts with ten hours of content. There went to one right. convention this year. We saw the yeah, video. One, from, yeah, okay, yeah, so that, that was then. good. I did not get to do that last year. I didn't do any live streams this year, which was kind of interesting. Mm. But maybe we can do something about that in 2022. And then, I think, um, we are. I think we're getting So, that. yeah, that was just an interesting amount of information. I did mm. have some stuff, too, that for 2022 to look forward to. Obviously, podcasts are here for. <laughs> I've really enjoyed it so far. So, I think that we can probably say. Uh, if we're both around creating content in 2022, we'll be sticking with our um, 
our podcast here because I've been enjoying it. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I know that I think you have too. <laughs> oh, look, Steve, there's something I want to tell you. I'm not yeah. ready to get into oh, this sorry. night. Sorry. So that's Now's it. the time to yeah, tell you. Yeah, that's it. This is, the, <laughs> this is the farewell forever too. So it's either that or that. So maybe we could do, and uh, you know, we've talked about hopefully doing this show a couple times live also. So that'll be something mm. over 2022 to look for. Um, I'd love that. So, um, yeah, I'd love that. I'd love to do it live. I'd love um uh, we'll discuss which channel should. Well, yeah, I think it's fine details, to switch it up. People some. to be there. So. Some questions. Uh, switch it up. The questions from people are, are really their input, and I've thought so much about questions and how to help people ask better questions. How can we help people more? Considering we're talking about friggin' television, like how to? It's very hard if you've got a problem with your television. It's very hard to express that in text. How to get that information across, and we want to help people, but it's. You know, it's hard to just do it when you're writing a comment and to find all those little things. Yeah, so we're improving. Yeah, it is. It's there. much easier to have a conversation because sometimes right. I even got messages today from a Patreon member who was asking about um, some things it's not working right on his Commodore monitor and sends a picture. But at the same time, it's like I need a lot of context too. where he said it was working fine one minute and it's not working the next minute. And it's like something happened in between there. So unfortunately, you kind of have to go back and be like storyteller and try to backtrack and then figure out, you know, like what went wrong in this thing. So that happens. I do know that we've been, I've been getting a lot of questions on some of the uh, playbacks on like where I am located. Again, I told mm. you earlier that I'm in a place called Harrisonburg, Virginia, and it's in, again, the United States. So if you have any questions, you can look that up. It's a pretty big city. And uh so also all my repairs at this point if you're not like somebody local or a contractual business like an actual business a museum or something all my other stuff is done pretty much through the patreon page at this point uh for that so actually that's yeah. a good question someone asked me this week like how do i talk to steve what's his process how does he evaluate the the situation and provide context so what is so yeah, straight up straight first up, of there's all what is the best way for someone? I've got a monitor. I think Steve might want to repair it. What's the best way to contact yeah, you? Yeah, so the first thing is, is there's a lot of people already in the Patreon system. So that's, I can't just stop. They keep me busy where I've got six plus weeks of work usually backed up. So that's generally a line. Yeah. And the way, but but if you have like something that you need just questions on, then I get constantly messages DM to me, and I respond back, of course, as quick as possible for Patreon members, um, and that's a lot of interaction. And the thing is, is beyond that, it's um, it's it's like this show. That's that's the biggest thing. If you if you don't want to go down those routes of doing that, and that's fine, then this show would be the best chance because. Um, at the same time, like it's this is this is you know this is my job now, and we'll talk a little bit more about that's actually a funny way to segment into why this is what I do for a living from yeah. now oh, on. Yeah, 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 yeah. But we yeah, do that one. it's literally uh, so I that's that's like when I'm actually troubleshooting and stuff. That's the work I'm doing. So I'm I'm trying mm -hmm. to um, support my business in one por one portion doing it that way. But it's also like I'm so busy. That's how you get into really the line or again there's always the option of this you can send me messages if you're uh you know on some side of social media and i do sometimes respond to those when i have time and i have extra time and i'm just thinking hey i want to answer some questions i do that sometimes from time to time but uh as things keep growing and going i don't really know that i'll have that a lot of time to be dedicating even to that anymore so unfortunately mm -hmm. i think the two best ways are obviously to go through the patreon page or uh send us questions and we will address them as best we can here and then of course during those live shows it will be even easier to interact i think back and forth with some people um specifically on certain things uh, and then uh so just so just to give a little bit of a plug right now if you are a patreon member and you are in the United States. Now, look, eventually, maybe two this year, I'll bug Lewis. I'll send him a huge package of these and make him repost them all to you guys over in Europe. I'm not sure how that whole European mailing I system that. that's, goes. That's a fucking so great that's, idea. So that we can get you guys stickers, too. But literally, so here's what yeah. I did. Over the last five days, I or well, it's been like eight days now, I opened a merch shop with 
uh, on the mm-hmm. YouTube channel. So if you look down, it, they're going to have banners of you of merchandise for retro tech and there's a lot of different things on there but if you go there um there's stickers and there's also you know other things and uh first off if you do that in the next five days and you go through and order anything they'll give you 15 percent off since it's a new store um it just gives mm-hmm. you that deal so if you go there now for the next five or six days you could still get 15 percent off but here's two of the stickers that i've got and I'm giving these Great, away. Man. I made an announcement in the video for this month's Patreon exclusive video, uh, but I'm giving them away if you're in the United States. I've only had about 5% of the Patreon members contact me and collect a sticker. So I know there's more people out there. If you're listening to this and you want a sticker, just DM me and um, I'll get mm-hmm. you one and free of charge, nothing. I'll post it and everything. Um, so that's the, yeah, that's a good way to talk about those two things: the merch shop and that uh, free stickers. And, uh, for that. Let's talk about those things. They're both interesting. First of all, the stickers. Yeah, let's do it, dude. Just send me a box. Yeah, of them and I'll because there's it a out lot of people because... in Europe that want mm. them, and for me to send them individually from a European oh, address, yeah. and I've had somebody else volunteer too from uh, Fed from France in the Patreon. So uh, we'll get something done where you know we'll send it we over can do something and there. and. Uh, because we've already, uh, with my my work that I do here in Estonia, managing this comedy group, uh, we have our merch. We're a little bit different in that we typically create, like, we do it the, the hard way, uh, which is to get the merchandise made and then sell it, which you might say is the, the idiot's way to do it these days. But we have very precise comedians who exactly, very precisely want to know exactly what thing has their name on it. So we've learned that we, our style is that we get it made locally and then we ship it out. But I, I see your way that it's through a company and it's made on demand and that makes a lot of sense for your your business and the way you're doing it. But um, yeah, if there's a box here, I could easily distribute them around mainland Europe. Uh, just a letter would be extremely cheap. Yeah. So I think we could do that for almost no postage as Great. well. Great, yeah, that's um, cool. Yeah, here. so I had to, yeah. put you to put you to work, but that's kind of what... <laughs> no, let's do it. I love it. That's a great get idea. Get you some stuff too. I'd send out a couple stickers. We do that whenever, um, how to say, whenever we send out some merch for our comedy group, you can buy a hoodie or you can buy t-shirts from various, from the comedians or from our group. Uh, you, We still have some DVDs for sale, um, which is like, why the fuck do you have <laughs> DVDs? Because we have DVDs only because it's like, it's something physical. They only cost like seven bucks these days uh, when we're even for the sale. Because, I mean, streaming is great. Everybody wants a download. Everybody wants their Netflix. Everybody wants that. But the sometimes some people, particularly when they're at shows, they want a memento. They want something physical. They want to say, hey, I did that. So mostly our DVDs were sold at shows where the comedian could sign it for you. And then that was really... Or the, actually, most of the time, the comedian would sign it if we send it. Um, so it's not so much like, oh, I'm buying a 480p file on a weird disc. <laughs> no, I, well, I'm buying that thing that the artist made, the artist signed it, and it's more of an experience rather than just buying a DVD off the off the shelf. So, yeah, we flogged a few items uh, in our time. And, yeah, typically we put a sticker pack in with every order. So for all the different podcasts we end, we'll, we'll throw in some stickers. Yeah. yeah. And everyone, everyone yeah, likes everybody stickers. likes stickers. Well, this is a Let's great stick. chance. We've gone almost an hour now. We can finally jump into probably what will be the thumbnail topic on this Christmas special. Wait, we're going to do it. I'm going to get myself another Yeah, beer. go for it. Wait, go wait, ahead. Wait, wait, I'm just going to like um, set this up a little bit while you go. Go for it. All right, I'll get my beer. Yeah, so as we've been, Lewis and I have been going over uh, past work experiences so today I have a very special letter to open, and we'll wait, of course, for Lewis to get back with his beer before we do this. But just so you know, uh, I have transitioned to basically doing uh, CRT work full time, and that includes the video productions, the podcasts, and of course, maintaining and restoring CRTs that I either find and then uh resell to the community or ones that are brought to me by members of the community so if you're listening and you've brought anything by or you've been considering it and uh really just want to say an extremely big thank you to you for this year it's not been an easy year there's been a lot of hard work and a lot of things have had to happen behind the scenes and that's kind of what we're going to talk about in a second uh but 
it's been a whirlwind. I, there's a lot of people that have helped me out, and I can't say enough thank yous to them, too, that have helped by offering advice and uh, working together with me. So that's just kind of where um, where, where I'm at now. It's like, again, I, I told, and Lewis, we were talking about my where I'm located and stuff that we've, that this is, mm. yeah, this is what I've been doing full time. And as a cool memento, now that you're back, I've set it all up. We've got here a FedEx, FedEx, Federal Express. Mm -hmm. And we're talking about the time yeah. Steve was fired on, well, this is technically the day after Christmas. So I'm going to try to get this all the way up here into the camera. So we can see it's a document. You had a document delivered to it says, you. It says, uh, it says ship, ship date. date, December 26, 2019. That's the day they sent <laughs> That's it. That's the day they FedExed overnight. This was overnighted to me again the day after Christmas. And um okay. so this was my old uh job was to be an insurance agent. I know that's real exciting and stuff, isn't it? But not uh, I spent 10 years of my like last life as an insurance agent mm. and this was the company i worked for um i'm not going to just say the company's name because i don't care you'll probably show you could look at that freeze it and see who it was but i will give you the letter and it was kind of an interesting situation so again i had been with this company uh independently contracted had my own agency business for over nine years and things really started to change with the structure of the parent company, you know, like halfway me starting with them. So I was really fired up to work hard and do things the first half of that time. And then the company, the yeah. Years, and then the, the company after good, that yeah. started putting more roadblocks in, um, uh, Mm -hmm. they, they were acquiring bad businesses that would then cause us trouble. And, and, and then they would say, well, since we caused so much trouble, we need to pay you less. And so it was constantly getting worse and worse and worse to a point where everybody that I had worked with had either sold their agencies to another person or had, again, gotten this kind of a letter at some point. Now the, um, so let's just open the letter and see what it says mm. here. <laughs> And uh, the reason I have this copy is because the company freaked out. I was out of town. I usually go out of town for Christmas. And I was avoiding their phone calls because the writing was on the wall kind of again. There was a, there's a union. And the union was putting out letters saying, hey, the company sent out 2,000 copies of this letter six months like before I got it. So it was in waves. Yeah. So I was like wave three of this. And... So what, what year was 2019. Sorry. So this is right. 2019. So this is like the winter right before, you know, the world went crazy, Co you know, COVID crazy. Right. So, uh, and at this, to put everything yeah. in perspective though, I'm trying to paint a picture of who Steve this, is at this so, time. So yeah, this would have been had, two years ago. Yeah. Steve. So I had been doing, this would have been like, I would have had half my, my YouTube was like half, I, this is like two, almost two years ago. Okay. So Right yeah, on yeah. two-year anniversary of this uh, would have been when this was going on. So, yeah, I was doing both. I was doing kind of just some repairs and videos and then still working in the insurance business uh, with my group, my core segment of clients that I had built up. This was a business I built up. I didn't go in and buy it. Mm -hmm. I had to, like, borrow money and then pay all that off through working and then started to have the business towards the end. Uh and so you're 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 locally dealing with these companies and individuals yes, helping yes, with insurance right. packages Home, and uh, essentially the the packages coming from the bigger right. company and you're buying and I was I was providing I was the only person that could provide that their brand of in, insurance and I couldn't sell any other companies I had an exclusive okay, agreement sure. with them and uh, that was really it and then. Uh, so we've got the letter here and I'll read this to you. Yeah. Yeah. I try to set this up, I guess. Um, obviously I was still reliant on that business at this point. Now I was mm. making some money off retro tech and, and, um, it was still not very significant though. It's like, it's yeah, early it's days. early days. It's just, starting a new and thing it's just more of days. a fun passion thing that was, um, you know, a hobby that w there was some potential with. And, uh, but anyway, I got this letter and again, I kind of knew this was coming. Um, and it's the reason I, I mean, I didn't really know when it was coming. They kept saying, 
before this all happened, it was quite strange. I had a boss and then she like left the company and then there was nobody in her position for a year and a half. And so that whole time of the year and a half, like when she left the day before she left, she came and visited me in the office and said, uh, you're on this list, you know, to be, if you don't get your act together, uh, we're going to, you're going to be fired. I said, what does that mean? What does get my act together? How do I do that? She's like, oh, there's no Mm -hmm. specific way. And I was like, well, that just means I'm screwed then. There is no, it's like, yeah. it's a sales job. So it's like, here, sell this much and you'll be fine. No, there was no answer to it. So you knew you were screwed. They just said, oh. I couldn't give no, you a no, sales no. number. So then, like, and I was like, okay, okay, whatever. So yeah. I, I was like, I know this isn't, this no isn't going to be good. So I, uh, yeah. I, I sat there and she was gone. And then it was the December that I got in 2019, I started getting a call from a new lady who was, taken her position and she's like i have to meet with you i have to meet with you and i'm like it's christmas it's the week before christmas my office is closed i'm traveling no i can't meet with you and she's like oh this is a matter of extreme timing urgence and i was like okay and so i was like look i can't meet with you i i can meet with you after the holidays and they wouldn't even wait till then so they literally uh that was christmas eve they went back and and wrote me this this uh this lady lisa wrote me this letter um dated um uh, it's kind of funny she put the date of 1227 on the paperwork but mm. as you saw from the fedex she wrote it for the 26th so that it would be arriving on my hands on the 27th so she wrote it probably the 25th the 24th who knows mm. it says steven steven steven, steven 1227 2019 yeah. your appointment agreement may be terminated on three months written notice Please be advised that the companies are hereby terminating your appointment agreement on three months' notice. Accordingly, effective 3-27-2020, you will no longer represent in any capacity any of the companies that are parties to your appointment agreement. Oh, and then it just says some more legalese. The company expects Mm. you to fill out your post-termination agreements. A representative will be contacted to retrieve all confidential property. Um, and then they wanted to take my telephone number too. <laughs> I told him to, I told him to suck, kiss my head. Wait, I took my to kiss. The telephone well, number? See, so I had my cell phone number that I had. Oh, on the ads yeah, and on the ads mean, and like... stuff. And then, uh, th- which I had always paid for. And it was linked to like my family account. And, um, so they were like, well, we're taking that phone number. And I said, no, you're not. You can't like not take it or you can't take it. Because that really wasn't in the, it said if I used the number as like my personal use before I started Farmers, then I could fight them on it. According to my contract, Mm. it said they couldn't, they Mm. couldn't demand it. So I just told them I wasn't giving it to them and I didn't demand it. Now, the funny thing was, is there's a lot of legalese in there. So what basically happened is the reason, um, and one of the reasons you get stuck in these agreements with these big companies is they do have uh, like ways of enticing you into it, right? So you could see there it said you, the company can give you three months written notice to terminate you, right? So they had to. So I mean, right. it's not like the worst situation, and that's kind of what it was. Is you get, uh, they say they're going to terminate you. That means they got to work three more months, but they're paying you the whole time, okay? Nice. And then. So that's 90 days notice. And then on top of that, they ha- to do that, they have to buy out your contract. So my contract mm-hmm. was worth a certain amount of money um, up to this point, and they would have had to have paid mm-hmm. that out after the 90 days in payments. So you do, it's kind of interesting, you know, you, which basically that amounted to six months pay for me. So you were getting right. almost nine months uh, of severance kind of, for getting knocked mm. off this job by them just basically cutting you. And that's for only way they could not do that is if they had some kind of cause like legal cause or uh, ethical cause to get rid of you. Otherwise they had to do that. So that's why I was never really that, um, you know, eager to just always be worried about being fired or something. I knew that there was that back door. The thing that really sucks. And you know, that this is the reason I know I was set for this. Uh, like, I, and the reason she said it was such a time limit is mm. uh, I was six months away from basically hitting a 10 year and mm. that would have made the payout number double. So they would have had to pay an entire year's salary if they'd have let me go another six months. And 
So they didn't, obviously, they wanted to get rid of me uh, around Christmas. <laughs> So the funny thing was, is, you know, I was flipping out. I was like, holy crap, man, the world's like, I don't know what the hell's going on. And then all of a sudden, like mm -hmm. within weeks of that, the, the rest of the world started to hit the turd bucket with me. And so I was like, well, we all are <laughs> kind of starting over here. And you don't feel so bad. Well, after all that. and yeah. I used that. I used a lot of the money and um a lot of that to set myself up here where i am now and the only reason i could do all this is because of the growth of things but also because i've completely eliminated uh i've taken that time the payout and everything to eliminate all my debts and have no um no high obligation on anything and it's it, you know that that really has allowed me the freedom to not have to worry about not being able to or to be able to uh take care of things with less money coming in if you're not spending as much of course i live a very modest lifestyle and things like that what are you talking about i see the yeah. wood panel back hey, this there. is that's fancy, this is real Steve. it's very fancy. this is the real wood paneling from like 1965 <laughs> it's it's warped and beveled in places so yeah it's it's high of the it's high of the, oh wait i can actually probably flick the camera up here so you uh, can see okay. my awesome ceiling i've never fixed oh, yeah there it the is. little water hole up there where <laughs> big, something yeah living living the, the big, big life here. Lifestyle. that's right there is the hole in the i'm ceiling. just in this wooden now you wooden basement like. shelter and that's it so um but yeah i thought that i don't know i i don't know if that sounds how did you interesting feel in that oh my moment. gosh like when you got that letter how did you work because like oh, oh yeah really? okay even even though i knew yep. it was coming i mean it's still a shock and it's still you got to tell your wife, you know, that was, that was embarrassing. Even and my knew, family. You knew it was coming. Well, you knew it was kind of, and you knew that you could look after, did you have an idea that it was like, well, even if they fire me, I'm still going to get nine months. Did you know that? Oh, well, I always already, knew or? that was there because my contract, I was like, wow. as long as I don't do something that they would have for cause, but I did know that they didn't yeah. really see when they didn't during this whole restructuring thing. And then when they fire that other lady left the company, uh, they actually did try to use something where I changed offices. So I had an office for a period of time that I split with another agent who was there mm. 10 years before me. So he was a really senior agent. Mm. And mm. so I split an office with him in town and it was both our agencies in one office for the same company. And uh, we had a secretary. Well, one day he took a buyout. He took he, somebody came to him and offered to buy his business out along with 10 other agents and he said i'm just selling and so he sold and i lost my office space because it was leased in his name and i wasn't going to pay the same okay. office lease space for two people you know take over the lease mm. and so i was like well i'll just find a new spot to lease from and so i got rid of that office and then farmers was like well we won't we're not approving they kept not approving offices i would submit like, I have to take an office, find an office, a lease, and then they would say, oh, well, you have to submit the lease and the pictures of the office, and then we'll have a board look over it and tell you if it's an acceptable place. So they kept saying that, oh, well, there's other agents in your town now, and we don't, we don't want you to have an office in that town. And I was like, well, you can't do that. And they said, yes, we can. And the funny thing was is, you know, throughout a period, a company will revise their contracts they had newer contracts, and in the newer contracts, I wouldn't have been able to fight them. But I had an older yeah, contract okay. that was phased out, and I was able to fight them with it. And they basically conceded and let me put the office where I wanted. And that I knew then that that I wasn't going to be there forever because the way they yeah, treated you're me, the target right? The now. way they treated me, I said, you know, you guys are just treating me like crap. And I told them that I said, you guys, mm -hmm. I said, and and. I, I, I really got frustrated because they would come back and tell you stuff and act like they're your friend. And I'm like, you just, you know, you spent this whole time just lying to me. And, and I call and they weren't used to that. You know, they're not used to little subjects calling liars and stuff. They don't like it. So after a year and a half, they just figured they'd bite the bullet, finally pay me off instead of waiting six more months. Because <laughs> mm. then they would have just had to so pay me you, twice you were, as much. So you were an independent, you were running your own independent business, but then they was still, the company was still obliged to cover things like the office and some no, other No, no, no. I was expenses. obliged to cover all that expense. Then why, then why do we need their approval for anything? Exactly. That's, that's what they started doing, saying, it, saying that they had authority over us. And, 
It was. Like, what do you that's care? Exactly, Just let me sell the fucking well, insurance And, and it was funny because me... it was before even this. It was a time nobody wants to come to an insurance office. Nobody wants to go meet with the insurance agent. <laughs> in what is this, right. 1973? This is internet this. times, man. Everybody was doing That's all my yeah. business was internet or phone. It was never uh, on the office that I've moved to. Uh, well, that was the good thing about sharing the office with the other guy. My expenses were low, and I never had to be there because he would always have it mm. open. But I would never be there, and I would just go work from the house, answer the phone, work from the computer there, and then do retro tech stuff too when I wasn't doing anything. So that was a really good time to be able to grow and learn things. And so now, yeah, now I've kicked all that to the curb. I actually did try to get with another guy for insurance for a little while right after this period and uh, start again. And it was just so uninspiring. And uh, the guy I worked, you the guy I worked with, no, and the guy I worked with was a total like <laughs> android of a human. I was, I would constantly be like, Some I was like yeah. constantly be like, dude, are you even really like a person? I would be in arguments <laughs> with him, and I was like, I just told you this, and I hold, and then, <laughs> and he would just like be robotically spitting off stuff, and I'm like, hello, Earth yeah. two. <laughs> I was like, so I knew the right away, and it was kind of funny. I ran, I you know, I left town, and I told him I was doing this. He's like, one day he calls me. He's like, so, um, you know, you're not selling as many new policies as I thought you would. And I was like, yeah, look, I'm doing this other thing now with the CRTs, and I just don't need it. I don't need the headache. And then he's like, oh well, I, I mean, come on, meet with me. I want you to stay on board and do. And I was like, yeah, okay. I went and met with him, and I was like, look, I'm really doing this. I'm leaving. I got my debts paid off. I'm 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 gonna do this. And he um he was like, Well, you always have a home with us and and I was like, Well, you know, you never trained me on how to like get get myself paid for like certain things. It was like a really long, drawn out process of like telling I I sold this policy, I need to get paid for it. It was a pain and never yeah. trained properly to do it. And with insurance you get paid every time something renews. So like the policy make, goes okay. into, make so yeah, so I had yeah. stuff that come up for renewal and I was like, so you never paid me for those. Like, it's like a thousand bucks. It's like, you never paid me for any of that. And he's like, oh, don't worry. I'll send you a list of everything you have and I'll pay and continue to pay for the next two years. And then like, I moved up here and he's totally ghosted me. <laughs> like, total, like, And I'm like, oh, thankful I did. I told him my family members, I'm like, don't go do business with this guy. <laughs> he's like, I was like, that's the only people I'd switched over. I was like, just go find, I'm sorry. I'm out. Go find somebody else. Don't leave it with this guy. Cause I don't trust him anymore. I, that's what I had. To, that's what I told him. I was like, I kept emailing and texting and calling and no answer. And finally I sent him a message and I was like, look, if you don't, uh, if you don't, I'm, I'm going to just write it off as a, I don't care that you don't pay me the money you owe me, but I'm literally going to tell everybody that I know that I wrote business with to stay away from you because you're not a trustworthy person. And I just still got ghosted. No answer for that. So, uh, whatever. It's like, it's funny. It's not, it's not surprising from our interactions. So I tried it. Uh, I'm done hopefully forever with the white collar crap, yeah, but with insurance. Yeah, it's not much. And I, and no disrespect. That's a hard brand, um, hard business to do. If anybody does it, uh, is there still Steve? So, so fill me in on insurance because, uh, okay. So I'm living here in a country called Estonia on the edge of Europe and they pride themselves that everything is online. We don't need to go to a bank. We don't need to do anything. We've got, I've got an ID card. I can log into every system in the country and do all the things that I need to do remotely. And I almost cannot imagine buying insurance from an actual person <laughs> rather than a website anymore. Fill me in. And uh, again, it's just my perspective. Fill me in on why I would need an actual person to help me with my insurance. To... Keeping oh, in mind, I why? Don't have life well, from the nothing. insurance company's perspective, it's to upsell you on crap you don't need. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, hey, you got to have the legal minimum to drive or whatever the law states. And then some people who have a lot of money, a lot of assets, sure, they should protect themselves. Uh, okay. But that's what it is to upsell you on the fear campaign and to like have you. But also do people do a good job where they they'll. Um, there's nothing wrong with somebody coming in and like, if you want protection for your stuff or yourself, them align, like that's where it is. It's like a professional consultation of me trying to align the right policy to match what you actually need to have covered, not to have too much, not to have too little. If something were to happen, I want to make sure that you're protected mm. and you don't lose anything. 
and then you come up with like a company that can provide that and then uh price the company will submit a pricing point for the customer so that's the reason that's like the good reason why you may want to do that and it's uh but it's what it really is like is it's awful you got to go and schedule you got to cold call people, schedule appointments either at their business or schedule at houses. Could you imagine the nightmares I've seen going into people's strangers' houses and uh, and trying to like sell them on stuff? And at the same time, you're like, this place shouldn't even be insured. It's like a hoarder. It's right. like a hoarder's. You like want to go out and, like burn your clothes after leaving a house sometimes. <laughs> Just and so like the first bit the first bit that you yeah. tell me like if you say okay i'm an individual and i need some guidance to what insurance should i have based off my portfolio and my assets and and all the things that i've got that bit makes sense and i'm get it like cool 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 but then yeah the next bit of like you've got to go around and do i mean then that's different to active sales and i've got to actively um prospecting and i've got to find those cold calls as you even said that's I was never, I'm not a good, I'm a good talker, but I'm not a good cold call salesman. Yeah, no, that takes um, a specific, like that, and it's yeah. not, um, it takes a different set of skills to be able to call somebody out of the blue and get yeah. them to commit to meeting and then have them actually show up. We have to show up. We had to pay a lot of people mm -hmm. a lot of money to get them to be able to do that. And it's something that a lot of people don't even want to do, which I don't blame them. And then there's a lot of laws to protect people from it so mm -hmm. it's not even a big it's not even a big fishing pot you're looking at but it's a it's a fine idea but the thing is they tried to take that idea of uh, personalized insurance stuff to the masses and that's not something the masses cares about or will be messing with the masses is not i mean if we talk about the mass of america like the the massive amount of people in america are not um don't have a portfolio to protect so uh, you're mm -hmm. trying to sell them on a value system where the basically the most important thing to them is going to be the price for what they what they're getting and so m most people as your observation as i'm understanding most people these days can be like yeah i can look at a website select from a couple of packages and i'm probably because yeah because that's what that. you're going to be I, I mean the only time you're pretty safe with a lot of that stuff, but then I don't know. It can be a cutthroat, you know, business where they a lot of the companies will screw people over because they'll have exclusion clauses. So you could get a normal insurance policy on your home. It's sure, going to be sure. 30, 40 pages of what it covers and what it doesn't. And mm. uh, so it's like the, the it's not got any less complicated over the years. No one's really cut out the complications. They're just. Was it difficult for you? So you're selling insurance. There's a company they they offer the insurance, and you're you're selling that to individuals. Was it hard for you sometimes when you sold a package and someone says, "But I thought it covered this," and the company's like, oh, "No, it doesn't." Yes. But they they don't think the company's bad. They think you're bad because you sold it. Oh to them, yes. Not oh the yeah. Of the yeah. Yeah. There was one lady. She would. I held, I felt bad because she was from like. She was from like Chicago, and so she'd always uh, have these Chicago like sayings that she would say that would just <laughs> sound too funny to me being a Southern boy. And she would always call and talk about these coverage things and not being covered or some exclusion. And she would always say, "Now, Steve, this is horse hockey, horse hockey." And I was like, "What the <laughs> hell does horse hockey mean?" Horse Which hockey. I guess is just a funny way of saying horse shit. But it's horse hockey, yeah, horse hockey. This that. is horse hockey, Steve. I when I came down there, you said it would cover this, and it's and you're not wanting to cover this now that this has happened. Oh yeah, that was always awful. And. Right, because you're trying to be a reasonable person. Yeah, it's your yeah. credibility. It's your your word. And so you're trying to do it. But on the other end, the company, well, they're a company. Yeah. They're conniving. They're they're doing this and that. They're moving around the the gray areas. And so you have to sort of justify, well, but, uh, I've, and I've run into the other situation, too, where your clients are trying to be shady. Oh, and, okay. And yeah. it's like the client will talk to you and you do and you're like, you do realize that I have to tell the company if you say sometimes I'll be like, I have to tell I have to tell the company whatever you say, so don't tell me anything that you don't mm. want 
the company to know. Um, and then I've seen like litigation situations be determined by the most simplest, minute stuff. Uh, people, you know, people lose everything and house fires, um, different stuff get covered. Other things you can tell people. That's why they have like an insurance record for people. They they file stuff normally than they file. There's a history of people that will have like a filed claims and a lot of companies will s just not accept you unless you've not filed a claim in a certain amount of time uh but yeah okay but yeah really it's uh and then see i've had i've had the interesting thing too this is another christmas thing that I, um where i had my house in college burned down right before christmas uh when i was a sophomore in college and it was crazy it was finals week and it was Aww. so I was living in like uh might as well have been a, f a fraternity house with six other guys who did nothing but yeah. drink beer and got stoned all day long. And I was the sure. only one out of any of them who managed to keep his grades up through all that and mm -hmm. go to class and by the end of the semester, you know, everybody else was leaving the house and I remember cuz I packed up my stuff and I was like, well, I still got finals, so I'm going to go bed and just sleep on the uh couch the community couch at the house and uh, watch TV and just do my finals and then come back home. So I moved all my stuff back from that house uh, to my house. And then I went to the first day of finals and it was a Monday and my roommate was like, Hey, I need to talk to you. And I was like, okay. And he's like, I didn't have a cell phone at this time. This was 2002. And sure. right. he's like, yeah, my, uh, I just got a call from my parents that said that your house burnt down and i was like what <laughs> you know i was like what and he's like yeah so i called my family and i talked to him like yeah we're all okay but the house you know caught on fire is three-story condo this is your family yes. home you mean? so this is my family okay, home yeah. like my my siblings uh, all younger than me still live there and my mom God. and so we uh the house burnt up all my stuff burnt up and i just remember because now i think about uh, what I was doing when all that was happening. And it was, I was uh, at that house watching Charlie Brown Christmas on a 20, like five inch wood grain console television that was left <laughs> there on a raggedy old thrift store couch, uh, watching mm -hmm. that because that's all I could pick up with the rabbit ears. Um, and, uh, watching that while the house burnt down, but it was, yeah, that was a surreal experience because you find out kind of what really happens yeah. in a full loss and like the companies come out and give you money and tell you to go buy all stuff because I lost everything. Everything I had burnt up mm. from my childhood. The family yeah, stuff. All yeah, all my clothes, okay. all my uh, all my video game stuff from when I was a kid prior to that. Uh, this would have been 2002. So anything before that that I had from growing up was burnt up in that fire. And so I had to go and get basically a couple thousand dollar check for myself to buy my old toys and whatever I wanted to with it. So at that point, you're like, I don't care about that stuff. I'm not going to spend it mm. replacing it. But I saw how that really happened and how that really went down. And here's like I went to uh, I would go to my professors, you know, that week. And I was like, look, right. I don't know how good I'm going to do on this final. I just found out my house burned down. And they were all like, oh, whoa, whoa, what? And. I was like, yeah, I'm not lying. And they, and every single one of them was like, look, don't worry about what you get on this final. Uh, I've, I had already gotten like good grades to that point. They said, if you mm -hmm. do worse on this final, uh, we're not going to hold it against you. Every single one of them said, we'll okay. give you the grade. If you do better and it helps you, we'll, we'll let it help your final grade, but we're not going to hold you. And then, so I did all that and like, I was like, wow, man, that would, that's a pretty damn good scam. <laughs> somebody to be yeah, like, it's not, hey, my it's house burned down in finals week so um but no that was honest That's truth what you're thinking. and i haven't studied enough torch yeah the house. right it's yeah, a good deal yeah. Yeah, uh, i tried to burn on, my yeah. house down to get out of finals no that didn't happen <laughs> but it did conveniently help me because again i was two hours away in a different state but it was right so you got some so you got a little payout yeah yeah so that, yeah i did and then i went and this is before you worked for insurance. Yeah, no, so this, this is when I was in. Experiences yeah. with insurance. And then I had another experience later on before I got into insurance, and I was still working in construction and concrete um, that 
and that was with my original degree. And he, I got into an auto accident where I ran into the back of somebody, and they sued me. And it went like all the way to almost a lawsuit in court. And I, they maxed, like they didn't even get really hurt, but they maxed out the benefits of my policy of a hundred thousand dollars. And then they wanted like 300 grand. And I wound up settling where I had to pay the guy like $3,000 outside of my own pocket. So that was another experience I had where, um, you know, it, it made me think about insurance because that's something where I didn't have any idea. I thought a hundred thousand dollars sounds like a lot of money, but when you get into an auto accident and somebody says they have pains or they get hurt, a hundred thousand dollars does not go a long ways, at least in the United States, so medical the, bills, the American medical and system. yeah. And if you have yeah. where you're going to say you lose wages because of the time that you're hurt. Oh, so if you have is. somebody who makes a lot of money, if you hit ran into somebody who's a doctor mm. makes 5 million a year, you're screwed or something. So, that was that part is very interesting yeah. about the li litigious nature of the American system, and like I mean certainly if, if someone if you hit me here and I had lost wages or I'd lost income, there's certainly recourse to do that. There's legal recourse. I'm not trying to say like oh in Europe, fuck you, you get into <laughs> accident, you're not going to sue. It can certainly happen, but it, it does seem like it's the norm a little bit more. The norm in America, like okay, I got a lawyer. He's going to be on it. He's going to do it. Uh, why are we not like that more? No, in you're Europe? lucky. You're not know, like that more why? in Europe. And that's a terrible part. Maybe we're like that in Australia. That's, that's a terrible like part of well. Western society is the litigious nature of everything mm -hmm. and trying to uh, make right. people pay for liability on things that sometimes are rightfully so, but a lot of times it's just attorneys, you know, turning basically sure, tricks. Sure, lawyers arguing with lawyers. Just to make their cuts, they, they and make that happens happen. That happens more than a lot. Like, I used to know the statistics for this but uh, because it was part of my job, but the average, the average, so not every instance of liability would go all the way to trial. You know, you'd have this, okay. set, this it sets up where somebody gets hurt or something happens and they feel wronged. They go speak to an attorney and then that attorney contacts the other person involved. And if you have insurance coverage for what happened, the insurance company that you have provides an attorney for you, okay, to protect mm. basically their end. Because then all of a sudden yeah, they're sure, liable they're gonna get, for gonna whatever the yeah. amount of money is. So that's kind of like how that works. And then you go through this thing ahead of time where they're sending like huge packets back and forth between you and the other attorney and it's all these claims where someone's like oh i couldn't i couldn't get my pecker hard anymore because of this accident and my wife co calls me a piece of trash now and that's worth 30 grand <laughs> <laughs> and you're like, what the hell? this is literally spelled out in these documents and so um i had to go to depositions on this one where that's the next step you go through bickering back and forth and then the company's like, yeah, you know, this guy's still asking for more money than we're allowed to cover. So you'll have to go and continue down this road till they accept your maximum mm. amount or they go and sue you, get your maximum amount, plus try to take extra from you personally, like my house, my cars, my family, my whatever, not my family, <laughs> my, but my yeah, money. Yeah, but so. We got to the depositions, and again, this is small town Tennessee, so you know the guy I hit was buddy buddies with so and so. The guy was like, a, and then you get this sleazy small town old man attorney, and he's in there uh, representing them, and uh, it was just hours of me sitting there uh, going back and forth with my with my attorney asking them questions them asking me questions and this real eccentric southern lawyer you know the whole time and so i'm just sitting there i mean this is hours this is going on back and forth questioning and there's a court stenographer there so the guy who's the other attorney is on across from me on a table just a regular business table and he's just taking oh. notes taking notes the whole time and then he's like sits the notes down on the table and then as my attorney's deposing and questioning the other person, he just looks like he's falling asleep sitting up, this attorney. And so I'm just sitting there bored out of my mind. And I'm just sitting there and I'm like looking around. So I'm looking like looking at his page of notes, you know, from the other type. Yeah. All of a sudden, my attorney's just crossing or 
talking to this person, his client, and all of a sudden this guy, he catches me with my eyes on his notes. He like wakes up and looks at me, mm. and he jumps up, and he slams the notepad real loud in the middle of all this on the table in front of me, and he says, well, why don't you just read it there then, damn it? And then I'm like, what? And it needs, in my turn, he's like, whoa, settle down here. What's going on? And then he's like, I need to speak with him outside one on one. And my attorney's like, that's not going to happen. You know, like you don't get to just say, I want to call a timeout and go talk with him. And this this attorney was so fired up, this old man. And that's probably what cost me the extra three grand was because he sent like right after that meeting, they sent one final offer. It was like one thousand dollar or the whole payout. And I would pay him three grand. And he thought I wouldn't take it. Right. Because I had no money to at the Mm. time. I was pretty broke. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they sent an offer with it, and I said, and my attorney was like, look, I'm not trying to tell you what to do, but you might just want to take this, pay the $3,000. I know it sucks, but it's much better than going on with this crap, going into small court with this crazy attorney and Mm -hmm. letting him go. And I said, yeah, you know what? You're right. Let's sign the offer, send it over there, tell him, uh, get it notarized as quick as possible and get it done and he said okay and we did that sent it back over and the other attorney was freaking pissed because he thought i would say no way i just want to have the coverage from insurance and then he would just rip me in court and saying that he made a decent offer but i decided not to take it and then like make me pay and so he was furious but hey that's the way it went and that's the way it goes and whatever glad it's in my rear view mirror but it was a crazy ass experience i'll tell you the truth it's so interesting that theater of court. Like it's a theater, it was, yeah. He found a moment to 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 make it theatrical. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And to make it big, like oh, you did. Uh, 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 <laughs> yeah, it was. And then it's all of a thing. And so you got to be careful. Like I didn't do nothing. I'm sitting in the fucking courtroom. Yeah, what do you so. want, Jesus? I'm not doing anything here. So yeah. So that was it. I know this happen. I know this happens all over the world. Don't get me wrong, but somehow stories about American legal system are far more interesting. And the way the things go round and round. That's why you, Judge I, Judy's I the number one show in America. Right. <laughs> I suspect it's because you American people are just much better at telling stories about. These oh things. yeah, and it's like and, and, and you have this and that and this side, and you're like, oh, what is it? Oh my god. What oh yeah, be? and it's much more complicated because there's matters of law, and if you actually do get into the courtroom, there's things that you think might impress the judge and it's like mm. that has no bearing and it's just like shut up you're gonna get contempt if you don't stop talking so it's <laughs> all yeah it's all interesting but um but that's it man that's the oh. that's our uh what do you think lewis that's our christmas special man an hour and a half here that's a christmas special i liked it man <laughs> i like that story i like i i fucking love these stories from your your child no, no your childhood but you're growing up and your stuff. experience your life and your professional stuff I love these stories. There's more. I feel like there's so many more of these stories inside of you. We're gonna. There get still to them. are, we're but uh, and then we're gonna start bugging you for something. I mean, I, I have to laugh. Yeah, I yeah, have you. been, uh, but I have done. The, I've worked tons of jobs in my life. I, I um, there's a there's a McDonald's down the street from here. It's still here, and I can yeah. remember. I was telling my kids this to tell them a lesson. I remember going into that McDonald's. And like saying, I want a job. I need a job and I want to work here. You guys are hiring. And they got, and then finally the hiring manager came over there and asked me to fill out an application and sat down with me. And he had the strangest look on his face right at the beginning of the interview. And he said, son, I appreciate your enthusiasm, but we are not legally allowed to hire 14 year olds (laughs) at McDonald's. (laughs) So please come back in two years when you're of hiring age. But I was like so eager to make some money and get out that I, I tried to get a job. I found a couple jobs at 15, but my experiences have ranged from being fired to resigning to, you know, getting let go like this to, oh, politics, all kinds it. of crap. Office politics, not oh, like something. real. Sure, yeah. politics, yeah. politics, <laughs> but still. But yeah, so... Oh. I love it. So we're almost at an hour 35, hour 40. So Let's do um it. yeah, this is our Christmas yes. special. I like, you know what I like about this Steve is we came back to us just talking about stuff about us. And I hope people are into that. I hope people if you you're still here yes, listening to the podcast. Still here. We love talking about CRTs. Don't get me wrong. I love talking about them all day long, but I love the the, the other stories that go around all the things that we Yeah, do. I think that's a great point. Life, yeah, that that know? um 
we're you know we're that's the whole point of this show is we're going to mix more different things and i think the more regular structure of this is we're obviously we didn't get to them today but we will be getting to questions a lot more in upcoming episodes um we're building up some questions too for future things Mm. so definitely keep sending those and your feedback we appreciate it and that's pretty much it we're all good so pretty chilled here it's uh what have have we got about 6 30 in the evening here so i think i'll go get some some dinner soon. I got a little steak fired up for awesome. me, and then and then chill out tomorrow. I think I'm going to go into our. Uh, oh, he, what happened to me this week was uh, I ordered some new light bulbs for our soft boxes in the studio. I ordered from Amazon. I ordered them from Amazon.de, which means I should pay the VAT to uh, Amazon, and it's done. But they still ship them into Estonia. Estonian customs said, "Hey, this is coming from outside European Union. We want VAT." So I wrote to Amazon. I said, hey, I'm being double charged for VAT. And they said, oh, okay. And then I got an email that said, you have been refunded for your VAT, 10 bucks, and you've been refunded for the light bulbs for 50 bucks. So I've been (laughs) refunded more than what I paid for the thing. And then I got the email from customer support from Amazon that said, oh, um, she, and the, the lady said, I pressed the wrong <laughs> button and I, ref- and I refunded you the whole thing. Can you send the money back? No. No, I can't send the money back. No, not no, unless you do no, some no, other no, shit. Yeah, a, like, no. no, we're keeping that. Those light bulbs That's for hilarious. our soft boxes are, us, are ours yeah, now. Like, oh, yeah, let me so just I'm send you 50 sh- bucks here. Yeah. Sure. Like, it sounds like a scam. Yeah, it does. Everything you've ever heard about like, an sorry, internet scam. is screwed if someone, up. <laughs> if, some, if someone's asking for money on the internet, don't give exactly. them money. That's like number one rule you teach people on the internet. So I'm like, <laughs> no, nah, I don't care. So uh, I've got I've got the these fancy new bulbs. Uh, I think I'll go into the studio tomorrow, record a, record a little, some on-camera nice. stuff with them. Uh, and then it's almost Christmas. Yeah, then it's, it's Christmas. Christmas time. We're going to go to... My girlfriend and I are going to go to uh, Tartu, which is the second city of Estonia. It's where her parents come from, uh, where I was staying after the accident. So we're going to go back there and uh, be with the parents for a few days, then come back to Tallinn. And uh, pretty pretty easy going. And then I know that we have a big... Uh, in between Christmas and New Year is a great time to do live shows in Tallinn, Estonia. It's a time when everyone's at home, they got nothing to do, no one's thought to put on an event, either like a disco or a nightclub or anything. And people, so we always have shows, as many shows as we can between Christmas and New Year because people just want to come out and do it. So we've got a really big show. It's in a theater. It's a roast of one of our comedians. He's up and coming and, you know, he's pretty popular. So, um, yeah, I'll be doing that in between Christmas and New Year, running that show uh, with my colleagues and having this nice roast in a big theater and uh, thankful that we're allowed to run shows. Always thankful that, you know, the, the government and the gods that be that let us do these things. So a um, little bit of home time and a few shows, and I'm happy with that right now. That's great. Yeah, that sounds like a lot of fun. That's cool. Yeah, something yeah. to do. Something to do. Roasts are always uh, fun. Yeah. <laughs> it is. Uh, roasts are so such an interesting thing because um, I, I think also because roasts are something that are regular, like, I have to say, regular people, not comedy people. You know, I mean, you've heard about a oh, roast. Yeah, yeah. You know roasts. You know the idea. Most people know what it is. And um, the, the thing with roast, though, is that you have to choose the, uh, the guest or the roast Roasty, whoever it is, the roaster, roast the roasty, roasted, uh, very you mean carefully. The person being roasted, person being yeah, roasted, okay. Because they need to. Um, often those Comedy Central ones are often about like uh, just whoever's hot right yeah. now or whoever's that. But to do a proper roast, you need someone who's had a body of work and they have many years of work, and you can go back to that work and you can pull that out and make fun about that. And we've never done. We have only done roasts for our own comedians in our group because the comedians know one another and so they know what to roast. And it's come up, it's like, well, here's someone who's popular. They're on the radio and they're super popular and that chick and she's the new hit chick. Why don't you roast her? And we're like, no, it doesn't kind of because we don't know that much of, even though they're really famous. Like, yeah, watch, you're like, oh, then I got to do like 10 hours research. <laughs> To find, on that just person, to find something to and roast then, about. And that person isn't, and that we also and you don't then, know I mean, them, so you part, don't know how they're going to... 
react and you've got to write their material because typically let's say it's the roast of i don't know some actor person they're not writing the script someone's writing the script for them you know so we are like here in estonia we don't have enough yeah, money to pay a right. writer to write their script so we need someone who can also write the script and it, it's sort of in the reality a roast often doesn't work as well as the hollywood would make you think it does but we can make it work when it's just our comedians because we know each other we're a group we know all the shit um this one guy daniel who is the subject of the roast i Essentially, it sounds wrong, but I found him more than seven or eight years ago. Um, so it was I was asked to come to a school here, like a local school, and they said, "Hey, Lewis, you're a you know you're English speaking, you're foreigner. Can you just come and give a talk to my English class?" And I'm like, "Well, all right, sure, you know, I'll come." And so I came, and there was probably about forty, forty five students there, and I gave a talk about comedy and what it takes to do comedy and how it means. And yeah, in that class one day was this little 16 year old kid, Daniel, and he was 16 or 17 and he was still at school and he's like, this is interesting. So then he writes me and he says, can you come to a, can I, what do I do? How do I do this? <laughs> and I said, come to an open mic. We have open yeah. mic. Anyone can come and perform. And he was performing with us before he could drink <laughs> alcohol. Like we were giving him the free drinks. He could get free drinks in the yeah. backstage because you don't get asked if you're a comedian you're like okay you get the free drink yeah. sure uh so we were serving him free <laughs> drinks in the backstage before he was even legal and, so that's why he thought it was uh, cool now, probably right yeah he thought it was cool of course you're fucking 17 you're like these right. other guys are gonna give me free like booze cool and, stuff. It's like when, and there's some girls yeah. there's some oh, girls yeah, at the yeah, show yeah. so oh, you're like wow, this just yeah, stands right. your mind. of course Bananas, college right? age girls and you're like 17 yeah, yeah, yeah he's loving it right so this was seven years ago now, and this guy, he's had a couple specials, and he's worked on it, and uh, now it's his roast. So um, I'll be there, and I'm very happy. It's well, like a cool. nice coming of age. That, that. So we'll do that, I think, the 20, I want to say 28th. I'm not sure, um, here in Estonia. So I'll have something to do That's before good. New Year. Yeah, awesome. At least. Yeah, mate. Well, cool. cool. So well, uh, yeah. thanks, hey, thanks, Aaron. Thanks, thanks for listening. For listening. On the, right. the main channel. And, and, yeah, go, yeah. go. Uh, last thing, go over and subscribe to Zez Retro for the rest of them. For from now on, appreciate that. Go over there, and uh, we'll have that. You know, the show will be on there regularly. So make sure you're checked out Lewis's channel. Nice. All right. Well, I'll hit the I'll hit the the end now, right. but we'll stay on the line. Stage, thanks, everybody. Do. So thank you very much for watching. <laughs>